Wildlife of the Vladivina at a Glance. Excerpt from the Merchant Traveler's Almanac, 238 edition. Introduction. There are many hazards along the winding roads of the Vladivina. Most often one will hear of outlaws, who operate in abundance despite the ever-increasing presence of chain guards in the countryside. In the more distant realms, one may come across witches, and yet further north rogue demons left over from the war still lurk. But for the average traveler who does not stray from the common trade routes, the most common encounters will undoubtedly be with the local wildlife. Unlike the well-settled lands of Nitko, the further north and east one travels the more open space there is to be found. These lands are still quite wild, and one may find that animals do not retreat from human presence as readily as they do in the heartland. While there are a great many wild animals one may come across during their travels, this section concerns itself mostly with those that may trouble an expedition in some way. For convenience, much of this section is divided up by region. Editor's Addendum As established earlier in the almanac, units are given in unike or standard Vladivina inches, and the 8 unike Vladivina link rather than Acrasian units. Insects of the Vladivina Unlike the other creatures we have chosen to list, the insect does not care to confine itself to any particular region of the Vladivina. Often migratory, these bugs can be found all across the country, particularly during their spawning seasons. More than likely these creatures will be foreign to the newly minted merchant, as Nitko is often too far south, and too chilly for these insects to make their presence known in larger numbers. Common Vagabond Moth. Size, 1 to 2 Unike. Description, black, with two rows of blue and red dots on its back, and strong bristles along its form, caterpillars. Brown wings and tussock with dark speckles, and feathery antennae, male adult. Cream tussock and wings with black speckles, straight antennae, female adult. Habits and demeanor. A great bane to foresters across the Vladivina, the vagabond moth thrives in any given wooded area. Newly hatched larvae release strands of silk, traveling to new lands on the four winds. Caterpillars do not bite, but their bristles may irritate the skin of some. Adults are harmless, though the males fly in unpredictable zigzagging patterns, and often collide with whatever is in their way. The only reason a traveler must be weary of the vagabond moth, is their nesting habits. Adult females barely move from where they emerge, laying dense egg clusters that they then cover in a tough layer of shag. Inspectors, particularly those along the toll roads to enter the Duchy of Platnost, will fine merchants heavily for hauling goods or wagons encrusted with vagabond eggs. The discerning traveler is therefore recommended to scrape them off, should one have the misfortune to be underway during their spawning season. Platnost Jewel Beetle, Size, 2-4 Uniki. Description, Large hard-shelled beetles with a shiny silver-green exterior, most easily identified by their very large jaws. Females are typically larger than the males. Habits and demeanor. A common sight in the great forests of Platnost, the jewel beetle is a large and sometimes troublesome insect, with a propensity for invading indoor spaces during the onset of winter. The beetle is very strongly associated with the region, its original Arishian inhabitants, using preserved specimens as jewelry, or crushing them to make iridescent paint. The creature is even represented on the duchy's coat of arms. Jewel beetles pose little hazard to shipping, but they are particularly attracted to fresh timber, and have given many warehouse foremen a fright once received in the cities. Their bite carries no venom, but the powerful jaws are quite capable of drawing blood, so one is recommended to take care when removing them from wagons or wares. Spreedus Biting Locust. Size, 2-3 Uniki. Description. Dirty brown exterior with yellow and black legs and abdomen. Noticeable jaws. Habits and demeanor. The woe of the Vladivina, and sorrow of the plains and prairies. The biting locust has menaced the realm since its earliest days on the frontier. The creature was first identified by settlers on the Nedeleki plains in 72. From then on, they have swarmed during irregular years all across the northern reaches. Though primarily herbivorous, once biting locusts have finished devouring crops and common ground cover, they have been observed moving on to other insects and carry on. Live prey is not out of the question, though even in great numbers it is still difficult for a swarm to take down any animals that can flee or swat away their attackers. The biting locust will become highly aggressive when its egg sacs are threatened, which tends to make extermination of the creatures troublesome. Their bites are not venomous, but those who have attempted to eat them in times of desperation often sicken as their shells contain a strong emetic component. 
Fortunately for all, the biting locust seems to be strangely ill-suited to life on the plains. Their eggs frequently do not hatch in great numbers, and often they will die back so dramatically that no sign of them will be observed for years at a time. Natural philosophers have so far been unable to determine any sort of pattern to their swarming years. It is highly recommended that if a traveler is caught during a swarm that they seek shelter, and stuff rags or dirt into any crevices the creatures may slip in through. Babies in particular should be kept in their mother's arms, and not left unattended, until the swarm has passed, or at least lies dormant for the evening. Merchants carrying foodstuffs are recommended to simply avoid regions during swarming seasons, as the destruction to their wares will be great enough that it is unlikely they will make a profit. Imperial Honeybee Size, 1 Unica Female Workers, Warriors, 1.2 Unica, Male Drones, 1.6 Unica, Female Praetorians, 2.3 Unica, Female Queens Description, Large bees with burnt orange and black striped abdomens, upper body is covered with a layer of golden fur, thicker than on conventional honeybees. Habits and Demeanor Bred in the days of the ancient Acrasian Republic, the imperial honeybee is likely to be known to even the most urbane of travelers. The long tradition of beekeeping is alive now more than ever in this age of advancement, and any merchant worth his salt has tasted imperial honey at one event or another. Travelers may therefore be under the impression that the imperial honeybee is a friendly and domesticated creature to mankind, having shared the comforts of civilization with us for at least a millennium if not longer. While this can be true for individual colonies, particularly well cared for ones on fertile land, it is not so out in the wild. Imperial honeybees live up to their name. They are conquerors, and they make war with just as much vigor and enthusiasm as any nation in human history. Imperial scouts comb large areas for resources, most often flowers, but also things such as fruit trees, fallen berries and weeping sugar birch. During mating seasons, freshly hatched and mated queens will establish new colonies in these scouted areas. These new colonies alarmingly, will be cooperative and even subservient to the authority of their progenitor colony. Unlike the life cycle of the conventional honeybee, imperial queens are remarkably long-lived, some specimens surviving for 10 to 12 years. Those that live long enough for their offspring to establish successful colonies, become empresses. Honeybee empires, most often consist of around 10 or so hives, but in the distant countryside, empires of 30 or more have been observed. Legends tell of bee empires large enough to prevent human habitation in a given countryside, leading to bee nations being marked on some older maps. It is generally agreed upon by modern historians that these tales are exaggerated. The aggression of a given colony depends on a number of factors. Colonies will of course act to defend their hive from threats, however, armies consisting of swarms from multiple hives may also gather to defend a location from intruders. It is unknown how bees from the same empire identify each other, but it is presumed to be by scent. Imperial honeybees have also been observed taking pupae from the nests of common honeybees and socializing the adults into their own ranks. These stolen individuals are quite expendable to the hive, often being used only for construction tasks when expanding the hive structure. When winter comes around, the surviving slave population is forced out of the hive to freeze to death. Travelers should of course take care around any beehive they come across. Those wishing to help themselves to fresh honey should take note of the size of the hive. Imperial hives are typically much larger than those of common honeybees. If one should find themselves attacked by imperial honeybees, the best thing to do is simply escape the area, the swarm will typically not follow. Hiding underwater while still in the area is not recommended, as the swarm will linger in the air waiting for the victim to come up. Smoke is effective and will always cause a swarm to retreat, but starting a fire safely while under attack is a difficult proposition at best. Chemicler Skeleton Hornet Size, 1.5 Unicai Female Workers, Warriors, 1.2 Unica, Male Drones, 2.5 Unicae, Female Queens Description, Black body with white stripes on abdomen, white legs, white underside and a white splotch on the front of the face. Habits and Demeanor Feared across the Vladivina, the skeleton hornet is perhaps the most dangerous insect in the land. Hives that survive long enough can become quite large, composed of hundreds of individuals, and their aggression is unmatched by anything else in the air. Skeleton hornet venom, while not toxic, is extremely painful, and one sting can lead to incapacitation in some individuals. Initially, settlers in the Nedeleki and Srajeni frontiers would destroy nests wherever they were found. 
This process went unchecked for decades, resulting in a dramatic decline of the hornet population. Ultimately, with this decline came an equally dramatic rise in the population of pestilential insects. The situation became impossible to ignore after multiple successive years of biting locust plagues. Opikun naturalists, studying on the frontier, observed that an active skeleton hornet hive would consume large numbers of insects to feed their growing numbers. This consumption was at a far greater rate compared to conventional hornets due to the size skeleton hornets tended to reach. Begrudgingly, the frontier populations allowed the skeleton hornet to take root in their lands once again. Despite their obvious benefits, skeleton hornets are still treated with suspicion. They are the bitterest of enemies with imperial honeybees, often making war on them and slaughtering whole nests for their honey and larvae. As a result, they are the bane of beekeepers, who are the only profession in the Vladivina with the authority to search out and destroy hornet hives on government property or land owned by somebody else. Otherwise, hives are only destroyed when they are particularly close to human habitation. Should a traveler come across a skeleton hornet nest, the best thing to do is to avoid panic. Skeleton hornets will attack immediately if they sense weakness in an intruder. Instead, one should retreat at a casual pace, too quickly and the hornets will pursue, too slowly and the hornets may take exception to one's presence. If they are led to believe you are just passing by, they will typically avoid contact. Individual hornets on lone missions are hesitant to sting unless threatened, and thus once again, it is key to avoid panic or distress when encountering one. Centurion metamere, or, the hunter velvet centipede. Size, 7 to 9 eunuchae, females tend to be slightly larger. Description, very large centipedes with well-developed jaws, often a dark blue color, with purple or reddish streaks throughout their form. Texture appears to be soft and velvety, but this is just an optical illusion. Habits and demeanor. Uncommonly for the insects in this section, a traveler is much more likely to encounter a centurion within the confines of a home or an inn than they are the outdoors. In nature, centurions do not grow very large and typically hide within fallen trees or beneath stonework. When introduced into a human home, however, they take quite well to the warmer environment. It is initially perplexing to the urbane traveler why the people of the frontiers, eccentric as they sometimes are, would allow infestations of these creatures to live in their homes. However, as any rural resident would explain, once one gets away from the cold climate of the Nitko region, the common pestilences multiply at a tremendous rate. Centurions are so named not only for their hundred legs, but also for their vigilance in defending their homes from such pests. The humble centurion will devour with ease, roaches, locusts, worms, weevils, other species of centipede, slugs, termites, ants, and even hornets that incur upon their territory. Large specimens have even been observed to devour mice, though rats are often too large for them to bring down. Centurions dislike even dim light, and will thus hide during the daytime or from a burning candle. Centurions also dislike the presence of humans, and will only emerge from the cracks and crevices when they are certain people are not around to trouble them. Small children should not be left alone in a building containing centurions, if only because they will likely find their colorful forms attractive and try to pick them up. Fortunately the bite of a centurion though quite painful, is otherwise harmless. Large insects do not take well to cold climates, and thus the centurion lies dormant in the warmest parts of a home during the winter months. Centurions are dependent on their human landlords in this way. It is unlikely that a traveler should encounter a centurion, but one may be spied crawling away when entering a storage room or an in-room that has not been occupied in a great while. In this case, it is recommended to let the creature escape, as killing it may earn the disapproval of the owner. Northern Plains Regions Once the great frontiers of Nedeleki, Srajini and Platnost, these areas have been extensively settled for the past hundred years, and now form the agricultural breadbasket of the Vladivina. The frontiers have since moved on, east to the vast Salinak frontier, and north to the recently conquered land of Kentorica. However, make no mistake, the northern plains though settled still contain vast stretches of wilderness. Often rolling plains or deep woodlands that to this day, no human has ever tread upon. A traveler from the confines of Nitko or Lesser Akrasia will find that the wildlife is both a great deal stranger and a great deal more aggressive than what they are used to in their domesticated homelands. Common Tentacle Leech Size, smaller than 1, eunuchae for juveniles, up to 7 or 8 eunuchae for particularly long-lived specimens. 
Description, long and thin, with a slimy, gelatinous body, varies in color from a kind of vibrant burnt orange to a darker blood red. Underside denoted by a line of anywhere from 3 to 100 or so small suckers. Habits and demeanor. A great pest of the many swampy regions one can find on the plains, the tentacle leech is among the lowest of creatures a traveler may have the misfortune of stumbling upon. Fond of stagnant water, the creatures will teem in large numbers. Females breed clouds of thousands of larvae, most of which are devoured by fish or aquatic insects before reaching the juvenile stage. Upon doing so, the tentacle leech will begin to feed on the blood of anything larger that it can successfully latch onto. This includes even land-dwelling creatures, which the leeches are particularly fond of. Due to their unique body structure, tentacle leeches are adept at snaking through and brushing away fur, into the crevices between armor plates, and particularly into the open holes of clothing on a human victim. Depending on the size of the specimen, a person can find their entire arm or leg, ringed with wounds from just a single leech. The one limiting factor to the tentacle leech, is that they are cannibals, and often when they run out of food to eat, the juveniles will begin feeding on any adults they can latch onto. It is not uncommon to find ponds or creeks that are home to nothing but leeches. Most local authorities try to limit fishing in these zones, to make sure there are enough indigenous fish to keep the leech numbers down during their spawning season. A practical-minded traveler should not find themselves in a location where tentacle leeches are present. However, should such a situation arise, it is recommended to strip naked upon exiting a body of infested water. No doubt the sight of a tentacle leech, particularly a large one, will be frightening, but it is key to remain calm and grasp as close to the center of the creature as you can, and pull upward in a quick but deliberate motion. Simply ripping the creature off by one end or the other, as often done in a panic, will cause it to sink rings of teeth into the wounds and pull the victim's skin open like a zipper. It is rare, though not unheard of for a panicked traveler to die of blood loss after the poorly executed removal of a large specimen. The enterprising merchant may take note of the fact that jellied leeches are considered a delicacy in Acrasia, particularly in the peninsular zone surrounding the great city of Salvoria. Platnost Fluke Glider Size, central body is typically 3 to 6 unikey in length, with a wingspan so to speak, of up to 1.5 links or 12 unikey. Description, a large fat worm-like central body with a pair of soft bat-like wings on either side of it. Four central legs each tipped with a single talon are clustered up near the head. Head is only a short tube with a sharp beak on the end. Ranges from dark forest green to black in color. Habits and demeanor. Perhaps the strangest creature to dwell in the mighty forests of Platnost, the fluke glider is a nocturnal beast that spends much of the day in the upper reaches of trees. During the day, the fluke glider will use its sharp beak to tap into a thick branch or tree trunk, and feed on the sap as it rests. At night it will become active, hunting bats, nocturnal birds or small ground animals for blood. Though loathsome in appearance and equipped with fierce talons, the fluke glider is a weak and delicate creature. It is not difficult for a person to simply tear one in half with their bare hands. For this reason, fluke gliders often stray away from large animals, but if suffering from deprivation or overcrowding, they may attempt to couple with larger game. Fluke glider numbers are surveyed and reported weekly by foresters. It is recommended to avoid the deep woodlands at night if they are particularly virulent. The wound of a fluke glider bite is often very deep. Once a glider is removed from a victim, exsanguination is of perilous concern. Having a glider wrap around the neck is almost certain death, unless the victim can be rushed to a skilled healer in time. Wild Army Rook Size, 17 to 19 unikey or about 2.5 links in length, with an average wingspan of around 38 unikey or 4 and 3 quarters links across. Description, similar to a common crow, black head with a trail down to its belly, black wings, tail, legs and feet. Remaining plumage on the rest of the body is a silvery gray color. Habits and Demeanor Much can be said of the great army rook, smaller than his common crow cousins, but thrice as clever and more accomplished by far. Any traveler likely does not need to be reminded of how indispensable these speaking birds have been to distant communication since the days of ancient Acrasia. But like any corvid, the army rook is not a humble creature. With his cleverness comes also great mischievousness, and though generally reliable, it is not uncommon for an army rook to desert his masters, and make a new home in the wild. This is particularly common in the case of owners who move inland from one of the coastal cities. This case of environmental shock can cause an army rook born and raised in domesticity to be tempted away by the call of the wild. 
The chicks these defectors raise however retain the cleverness and vocabulary of their parentage. While it may be of a great novelty to the average traveler to have a prolonged conversation with a wild bird, this quirk becomes much less amusing when one hears voices calling out to them late in the middle of the night from the woods. Common utterances from wild army rooks include insults, shouting, pleas for help, sobbing, coughing, screams of agony, chattering, questions, orphaned punchlines, demands, and the occasional immodest cry of sexual climax. Ships' whistles are also common in coastal areas, and in general the wild army rook is quite an accomplished musician. More than one traveler has been led to his death searching for the source of a jaunty tune sang by an oblivious wild rook. While these utterances obviously cause no direct harm to those that hear them, they are unnerving in the best of circumstances, and are often quite distressing. Even when one figures out that it is a rook they are hearing and not a person, the incessant chattering makes it quite difficult to sleep. Worse still is that wild army rooks are thieves like any other corvid, but being much cleverer, will often deploy one bird to make a distracting racket, while his accomplices raid the unattended goods. Wild rooks like most creatures typically avoid human contact, so time spent out in the wilderness is not always likely to be so inundated with annoyance. Traveling merchants are still well advised to keep track of jewelry, metal coin, cufflinks, fancy buttons, watches, and military decorations. These objects are best placed in a wooden box and weighed down with a stone or some other item that the bird cannot move on its own. Lockboxes will not work unless they are of excellent quality, as the wild army rook is often quite adept at picking simple locks. Agni Crow. Size, 20 to 21 unique or about 2.5 links in length, with an average wingspan of around 42 unique or 5 and a quarter links across. Description, outwardly an absolutely normal looking black crow if a bit large, but not quite as large as a common raven. Habits and demeanor. Once believed to be mythical, modern sightings and studies by the Opiacun order have confirmed that this creature does indeed exist. Agni crows are otherwise common crows that have the quite surprising ability to summon fire as they pass. There is no particular way of telling an Agni crow from the regular variety until it decides to cast upon its unsuspecting victim. Typically, these victims tend to be poachers or other unwanted interlopers. The exact incidence of Agni crows is unknown, though encounters with them are very rare, which would suggest they exist in small populations at best. Dominionist scholars often opine that the Agni crow's pyromancy is demonic in nature, but this has been challenged by some scholars of Orishian oral history. According to tribal legends, the Agni crow is at least neutral to human affairs, and one of its kind supposedly bestowed the gift of fire to the human race. It has been suggested that this is why many Orishian tribes lack the ability to make fire on their own and must save hot coals in order to do so. Monk Vulture. Size, 25 to 28 unique or about 3.5 links in length at maximum, with a wingspan of 72 unique or 9 links maximum. Description, fairly large species of vulture with off-white or gray plumage. Plumage of non-intihar vultures is more often dark brown head is featherless, while there is a small clump of down on the nape of the neck, which gives the appearance of a hood that has been drawn back. Habits and demeanor, perhaps not an unheard of sight to the common merchant, given that white monk vultures, the so-called white-robed variety, are held sacred to the Opiekun order and protected from hunters. However, as their protected territories lie in the Intihar mountain range, the monk vulture is still something of an uncommon sight close to home. In the north, this is not so as the monk vulture thrives on the carnage of the frontier. Intense competition with the many corvid species as well as larger enemies such as the warbird eagle has made the brown-robed monk vulture more aggressive than its white-robed cousin. Monk vultures will opportunistically hunt small game, including other birds, and sometimes attack larger prey that is wounded or sick. This typically only occurs in situations where there is not enough meat to go around. The traveling merchant should not come into direct contact with a monk vulture unless they have run across some sort of misfortune. The birds are best chased away using stones or other thrown items, as they carry debilitating and sometimes fatal diseases. If a wounded man has been pecked at by a monk vulture, he is highly unlikely to survive the night unless administered powerful elixirs by a professional healer. Brown-robed monk vultures, while not sacred, are still considered good luck to the Opican order, and mystics will take offense if one is killed or injured in their presence. If there is a persistent issue with the creatures during your expedition, it is recommended that you take the time to exterminate them far away from civilization and prying eyes. This is best for everyone, as the disease riddling their carcasses makes burying them an almost suicidal task.
Kentaurik and Slime Boar, Size, Average of about 4.5 links from nose to tail, Shoulder height of only 2.5 links. Description, Small, squat wild boar with no mane, Has a very thin layer of downy fur, Often appearing almost hairless. Skin ranges from blackish to swampy green. Habits and demeanor, An unfortunate leftover of the centaur wars. The slime boar is an odorous, unpleasant creature, Known for its strange ability to produce a thick, mucus-like substance from both its snout and its rear. This substance can range from benign to horrendous in its stench, and is often used to deter predators or mark territory. Even the bold and feared Srajini longwolf will typically avoid a slime boar that has made its presence known. Once a staple food of the centaur nomads and their Arishian tribal thralls, slime boars were imported by Kentarican refugees near the end of the centaur wars. Due to plague, war casualties and the burning sky, Srajini had already been suffering extensively from famine often reduced to harvesting insects in order to make it to the next day. The slime boar presented an easy solution to the hunger amongst both the regular population of Srajeni and the incoming refugees that were needed for labor. Accounts of the centaur war and its surrounding famine abound of stories about how bitter and vile the taste of slime boar flesh was. Even the Kentaurikans regarded it as unpalatable. However, the slime boar is a tough, hardy animal that could survive on almost nothing and grew quickly. Further, its secretions were rich in protein and could be used as a soup base, at least when from the front of the animal. Upon the retreat of the Skyfire and Srajeni's recovery, more conventional cattle rearing could return. In particular the population now had the numbers and the tools to maintain herds of Aramanthus boars on top of domestic cattle. Slime boars were culled en masse, often with great catharsis, by the population of Srajeni. It was said that the stench of slaughtered slime boar carcasses could be detected as far as neighboring Platnost. Most of the bodies were fed to the new herds of Aramanthus boars. Even though their period of farming had been a scant handful of years, enough slime boars escaped captivity during that time to maintain wild populations. Srajini's vast plains are overall similar to the Kentorica region they hail from, and thus the swine had little trouble adapting to their new home. As there is almost zero interest in hunting these creatures, their numbers have remained fairly stable, and they are a common encounter on the frontier. Slime boars can be aggressive, but lack tusks. A fully grown specimen may be able to batter a man to the ground and trample him, though this is somewhat unlikely. Typically an encounter with a slime boar poses little mortal danger to a traveler, but should they decide to attack with their eponymous slime, the results are often less than pleasant. Depending on the season, the scent may be outright impossible to remove from garments, and the victim will likely be tempted to burn them. Travelers are recommended to keep an eye out for the presence of slime on rocks or in grassy areas. Even if there is no strong smell, this usually indicates that a slime boar frequents the area. Srajini Stormcrow. Size, between 70 and 80 unike, a maximum size of 9 links. Wingspan is stubby, often only 1 or 2 links. Description. Very large flightless birds that resemble a crow with a long serpentine neck. Legs are also quite long. Beaks are bright yellow, contrasting strongly with their all-black plumage. Habits and demeanor. One of the more dangerous predators that travelers may encounter, especially on foot. Storm crows make their homes on the vast open grasslands of Srajeni, and have been a significant impediment in settling the region since the earliest days of the Vladavina. Like their more common corvid cousins, the storm crow is a wily beast that is capable of surprising creativity. In this case however, their tremendous size makes them an even match for a person, and more than one unwary traveler or hunter has found themselves disemboweled by the bird's large talons. The storm crow is mercifully a solitary creature by nature. The largest flocks observed have typically been about eight or so individuals, and usually these are families where the young have not left the nest quite yet. Even experienced hunters, both settler and Arishian, will avoid such gatherings as the parents will absolutely fight to the death to protect their young. A traveler on foot is unlikely to escape a pursuing storm crow. Ideally should a traveler encounter a docile storm crow, they should leave the area quietly so as not to spook the creature. If a traveler has already made camp or otherwise cannot retreat, then it is recommended to take to the highest tree. Storm crows are too large and heavy to climb though they have been observed leaping up and pulling the top of a tree over to fling prey from its upper branches, so it is recommended that travelers select an aged, strong tree. The marksmen among our readers may wish to take a shot at a storm crow once they have attained a safe perch. If properly armed with an arquebus, or perhaps an expensive rifled musket, this is reasonable as there would be little else to do while waiting for the creature to get bored and leave. 
Bowman will have a much tougher time of it, as a Stormcrow head is quite small. Aiming for the heart can be effective, but should you wound a Stormcrow, it will often become enraged and hound its attacker until it bleeds to death. Once killed, Stormcrow meat can be eaten, though it is reportedly quite tough. It should also be noted that Stormcrows will feed on carrion like other corvids, including dead human bodies. A traveler who is more religious may not want to risk partaking in one-step removed cannibalism. The Stormcrow is considered a pest by the locals of Srigeni. This is something of a bitter irony to them, as during the Great Famine of the Centaur War, Stormcrow meat was in some cases the only source of food that could be attained in certain areas. The fact that thousands of bodies had to be left unburied, due to labor shortages, is not lost on anyone. If traveling with a local guide, they will likely refuse to eat any of a Stormcrow kill, especially if they are on the older side. It is strongly recommended that the traveler avoid pressing the subject with them, if this is the case. Srajani Longwolf Size, average of 4.5 links shoulder height, with an overall length of 8.5 links nose to tail. Description, lanky, often thin with a slender muzzle and sharp ears. Coat colors are often dusty gray or a reddish cinnamon gray, with the occasional black specimen. Coat is much fluffier in the winter season. Habits and demeanor. Sometimes called, the enemy of civilized man, the long wolf has been a common and hazardous competitor since the dawn of the frontier. Even before this, Orishian oral tradition records that tribes rarely attempted to stay long on the Srajini plains, as they would sometimes be set upon by packs of long wolves. Since the arrival of Narastajan settlers in the 100s AE, long wolf populations have declined somewhat, but remain one of the greater dangers on the frontier. More intelligent than their Orishian or Gorslavan counterparts, long wolf packs have occasionally been observed working in tandem to take down much larger prey. Hunters and trappers also have a difficult time eradicating populations. As once one pack is wiped out, this typically alerts others in the area that something is amiss, causing them to go into hiding or retreat to remote locations. Long wolves are also adept at preying on herd animals, and are typically the most common menace to any farmer. This was a major factor in the breeding of the vicious Srajini war shepherd dog. Even with these measures in place, long wolves still encroach on human activity wherever they can. It is rare, though not unheard of, for isolated single-family homes to be raided and slaughtered by a pack of long wolves that felt their territory had been encroached upon. In one stroke of good fortune, long wolves do not often carry lycanthropy like their more alpine cousins tend to. Despite their obvious antagonistic relationship, long wolves are still a common sight in the artistry and symbolism of the frontier. In particular, two adorn the Principality of Srajani's coat of arms, and two are also present on the venerable Vladivina Order of Merit Medal, awarded for conspicuous gallantry. The popular legend of the noble wolf, is a strong one, and a common bedtime story for children meant to teach that even the most dangerous and savage creatures, can sometimes become civilized. Travelers that visit the Srajani region, would do well to protect themselves against the long wolf. Due to the vast size of the land and its nature as largely open ground, Many of the trade roads that pass through it, are long and remote. Stagecoaches and wagon trains are not often harried, unless they are traveling with cattle. However, lone travelers or small parties that choose to make camp, are easy targets, and it is recommended to have at least one, if not three experienced marksmen present to defend the campsite. Great Warbird Eagle. Size, 60 to 66 unique in length, or about 8 and a quarter links maximum. Wingspan often exceeds 14 and a half links, particularly in larger subjects. Description. Very large powerful eagles with gray, brown or golden plumage. Heads are pale gray or silvery, with a crest of larger black feathers or war plait extending from the back of the neck. Feet are often covered in dark yellow scales with 1 to 2 unica talons, and a large 4 unica talon at the back. Habits and demeanor. The image of the great warbird eagle is a common one to the urbane merchant. Its visage adorns the heraldry of the guild, the wardenry, and the naval office. Indeed, the body of the great three-headed eagle of the Narastaja Vladivina is a great warbird. But as the bird has been hunted to extinction in Nitko, it is unlikely the traveler has ever laid eyes upon a living one. Even accounting for the small preserve the Opikun order maintains outside their monastery fortress of Vizabablan. Out on the frontier, once spied, it is easy to mistake the great warbird for a hallucination, or a regular eagle that appears much larger due to a trick of the light. Should the bird choose to draw closer, its size and might will quickly become apparent. Though the storm crow as detailed above is overall heavier, it cannot take flight. 
The great warbird is thus the master of the sky, and preys upon typically whatever it likes, including the mighty storm crow. Needless to say, this avian has captured the imagination of numerous cultures throughout the history of the region. Erishian tribes would include the retrieval of a warbird feather as part of their warrior initiation, while accomplished chieftains would have elaborate headdresses and armor adorned with them. Acrasians too admired these great creatures, and the seal of the now defunct Acrasian Republic bore one clutching an olive branch as a symbol of its democracy. While a majestic sight, living in the domain of these powerful beasts is another matter. Locals tell stories of children being snatched away from their parents after a moment's lapse in attention. Cattle are of course always at risk, particularly goats, but often sheep, and small hogs as well. Warbirds are not fond of the fight that canines put up, this has led to the crossbreeding of warhounds with shepherd dogs to better equip them against the dangers of the sky. Despite the reverence a great many have for warbirds, on the frontier they are a menace and may be killed with impunity. Actually doing so is another matter. The warbird presents an obviously large target, but similar to the dreaded storm crow, its ability to retaliate is rather considerable. The rich will pay highly for their eggs, which are considered a delicacy and often used at the dinner table as a sign of immense wealth. It is recommended, unless the traveler is particularly disciplined and experienced, that they simply avoid encounters with warbird eagles whenever practical. Merchants that drive cattle, especially smaller cattle, will do well to make use of trained sharpshooters armed with shot. Netaleki Gleam Toad. Size, maximum of 12 links in length, width is typically between 9 and 9.5 and links across. Description. Extremely large toad with a mottled, bumpy brown hide that often has streaks of yellow and green throughout it, almost indistinguishable from a drift of dirt or dead leaves when partially submerged. Always covered in a slick, shiny film even out of water. Habits and demeanor. A common sight on the trade roads through Crescina, the humble gleam toad, may not appear significant to the inexperienced traveler. Average specimens will fit in the palm of one's hand and are very common prey for many of the predators that lurk in the wild. Further out into the heart of deep mires, one may find larger dinner plate sized specimens that serfs sometimes harvest for food. But that is not the extent of the gleam toad, as this creature will simply never stop growing so long as it lives. In locations where there are ample predators and strong human habitation, there is always a limit on the sizes they can reach. In the wild swamps of the distant Netaleki frontier, where it is not unheard of for even Arishian tribes to never visit certain areas, there is no such obstacle. Gleam toads that remain fed and secluded will absolutely become man-eaters, and occasionally experienced hunters must sortie out to kill a particularly troublesome example. It goes without saying that a trade road over swampland is not exactly an ideal means of travel. Thus, it is highly unlikely that the traveler will come across such a beast. In the event that one does however, it is recommended that they always carry a modestly sized knife. Larger than a work knife, but smaller than a survival knife. Though the swift tongue of a large gleam toad can be avoided, this is not a certainty, and the ability to attack the creature from within is essential to convincing it to spit out its last meal. A knife that is well honed and easy to draw is best. Platnost Great Stag Elk Size Average shoulder height of 7 and a quarter links, with an overall length of between 12 and 14 links nose to tail. Description An elk that, rather than bearing the common shaggy fur of its contemporaries, has identical spotted gold fur to the common Platnost deer. Antlers are also very thin and deer-like in appearance, though of course much larger. Habits and Demeanor A rare sight even in its native forests of Platnost, the Great Stag is considered one of the most splendid creatures of the Vladivina. One adorns the heraldry of the Duchy of Platnost itself, front and center, while the image of its antlers is a common symbol used by lesser noble families and frequently occurring in artworks. Hunting of the Great Stag is a most prestigious affair. Traditions related to the hunting of Great Stag extend back to ancient Acrasia, particularly in the Myrene Empire where the killing of one was considered symbolic. In the present day the Great Stag is merely a highly prized trophy, and its almost continuous decline in numbers has meant that only the progressively more rich and influential can afford to legally hunt in Platnost. Most Great Stags will avoid human contact, preferring to live very deep in the woodlands where there is limited settlement. Sightings of them on certain back roads are not unheard of however, so it is best to exercise caution and try to avoid less traveled areas during their rutting seasons. If encountered, a great stag may choose to defend itself by killing the interloper, often by crushing or goring them with its tremendous antlers. 
travelers in theory have the right to defend themselves by killing the animal in this situation. However, the population of great stags is so low, and the hunting of them of such great interest to those in power, that it is almost certain the killer will be arrested, and likely imprisoned for killing one without a permit. Arimanthus vast boar. Size. Average of 15 lynx nose to tail for fully grown adults. Largest ever recorded measured 18 lynx. Description. Profoundly large boars. Minimal tusks despite their incredible size. Thin fur is gray-green or yellowy-brown. Habits and demeanor. A blessing as much as a curse. The Arimanthus boar is speculated to have hailed from an ancient Acrasian site, somewhere around the Stepanese woodlands. Artifacts recovered from the area frequently depict boar heads, and it is speculated that the ancient Stepaniti revered boars as a symbol of their war god. Thus was bred an animal that could match such a legend in both size and ferocity. Whatever its origins may be, the Arimanthus boar escaped the confines of its native Acrasia and migrated north. It is believed that the open plains allowed the creatures to grow even larger, up to their modern size. Modern ranching practices and effective culling techniques have only increased the maximum size a boar may reach if it is long-lived enough. Aggressive and territorial, the Arimanthus is often the number one natural cause of injury or property destruction out on the frontier. Despite this, the animal is still allowed to roam in large numbers due to the large amount of meat that can be harvested from even a single kill. Like all other swine, the Arimanthus can live on just about anything, making otherwise useless in fertile scrubland an essential source of food for surrounding communities. The creature's size is not without some drawbacks. Anything that depletes local plant life, such as locust outbreaks or the Skyfire incident during the Centaur War, will usually cause populations to migrate. Those that stay behind will become aggressive and raid farms for food. At the height of the Centaur War, the Arimanthus boar had become virtually extinct in the region of Srajeni. Populations can always be replenished from surrounding areas, but if the Vladivina as a whole were ever affected by such conditions, the creature would be unable to maintain its vast bulk. Travelers on the road should be extremely weary of encountering Arimanthus boars. Typically the creatures travel in large packs, and during migration seasons will roam in tremendous, nearly unstoppable herds. It's not uncommon to see settlements bristling with spiked barricades to discourage the creatures from stampeding through. A wealthy traveler would do well to make use of a blunderbuss or large boar rifle loaded with shot. It is unlikely to kill a charging boar, but they will retreat if wounded in the eyes or snout. Weasel Dragon. Size. Average of 30 links in length from nose to tail for adults. Description. A very long, slender, almost worm-like lizard with four legs. Entire body is covered in a layer of slick water-resistant fur. Coat colors range from flat black to more common brown-gray. Two horns on the head and a row of spikes down the back indicate a male specimen. Habits and demeanor. Once a common sight in the wilds, the weasel dragon is now something of a rarity. This lengthy lizard both terrorized and awed early Acrasian civilizations. A great deal of ancient artwork and modern heraldry depicts the creature, often wrapped around tall spires or large trees, as they posed a significant danger to human habitation, they were killed at every opportunity. Study of weasel dragons is somewhat difficult owing to their scarcity and the extreme distances from civilization that they inhabit. One has not been sighted in the Srajeni region for decades, and it is speculated that the remaining population exists somewhere out on the vast Salinac plains, where the sparse Rusevine tribes pose little threat to them. Historically, weasel dragons have been said to hunt large game, they breed in very small numbers, sometimes laying only a single egg in 30 years, and are reclusive. Nesting sites have been everything from deep woodlands to naturally occurring cave systems. Should a traveler encounter a weasel dragon, it is best to avoid conflict with the creature, as it is unlikely you will be traveling with any artillery to fell such a large beast. Take careful note of its location and appearance though, this information will be valuable to local authorities, particularly any Opiekun monasteries. Chthonic Zoa Size, varies, largest recorded specimen reported to measure an estimated 50 links in diameter when still. Description, a large completely amorphous liquid mass of gelatin-like material, surrounded by a thick lightly green membrane. Color will appear pink or red after having freshly eaten. Habits and demeanor, few creatures in the land can claim to be so universally reviled as the great and pestilential Zoa. Thought to be a demon in previous eras, modern study has indicated that this strange monstrosity is actually of natural origin, with natural philosophers describing its form and physiology as primordial. 
Current theory has it that the Zoa emerged when the crust of our world was still young, and the air was thick with ash and heat. How the Zoa live on a day-to-day -day basis can only be speculated at, as they reside deep within the cracks and crags of the earth. Due to their liquid nature they can flow down into spaces no man could even attempt to follow them into, often making them difficult to dispatch. Humans usually encounter this nightmare when it emerges at the height of summer to feed. Deep mine shafts may also hit veins that the creature can seep out of. Zoa ignore plants, preferring the flesh of animals. There is no limit on the size of such a creature, and they will grow ever larger and more dangerous as they feed. Some specimens have been reported as the size of a house cat, while those that grow out of control can become large enough to be mistaken for small floods when they are on the move. All of a Zoa's body is highly corrosive, and anything that the creature flows over will meet its doom in short order. Smaller Zoa will kill their prey by eating through into the veins and vital organs, while large ones will simply crush victims to death once they are pulled inside. Once a Zoa has drawn in enough mass, it will retreat to digest its meal. This process usually takes several days, sometimes up to two weeks depending on the size of the creature and its meal. Fortunately, the Zoa's liquid nature makes it vulnerable to a number of environmental conditions. Contact with bodies of water larger than itself is typically fatal, causing the creature to dissolve and die should it flow into a lake or pond by accident. Heavy rainfall will also deter the creature, and it is completely defenseless against even mildly chilly temperatures. Zoa are however impervious to most forms of conventional attack. Explosives have been used effectively on small specimens, the creature lacking the ability to reform after being splattered, but on larger ones, they are able to absorb all but the most powerful blasts. Fire can be effective if there is enough of it, though the creature is typically smart enough to flow away from intense heat. The ideal method of dealing with a zoa is intense acid. The alchemical reaction produced by even a single large flask of it is enough to severely injure or kill even a large specimen. Since the advancement of the alchemical sciences in the last 150 years, zoa have gone from a seasonal phenomenon to only an occasional menace. The population can never be eradicated entirely, however, as there will always be more bubbling up from the depths of the earth every so often. Should a traveler encounter a zoa, it is highly recommended that they retreat as fast as possible, preferably on horseback. Even if supplied with potent enough acid, it is best left to trained professionals to dispatch the creature, and the local military garrison or Opiekun monastery should be notified of any sightings at the soonest possible opportunity.